surrounding Hitler's escape out of Germany to Argentina. After five years of research, journalist, writer and film director Gerard Williams along with military historian Simon Dunstan claim they have finally pieced together the real story of the death of Adolf Hitler. Previously unpublished intensive field research in Argentina, including interviews with many eyewitnesses to his presence there, new findings that prove the Hitler skull fragments held by the Russians are actually that of a young woman and previously unpublished scientific evidence, proving Hitler had a double being used in public in Berlin as late as March 1945, make the story compelling. Gerard joins us to discuss his book, Grey Wolf, The Escape of Adolf Hitler. Welcome to Red Eyes Radio, Gerard Williams. It's excellent to have you with us. How are you today, sir? I'm fine, Henry. Thank you very much for having me on. You bet. I saw you on Sky Channel a few weeks ago, and I thought to myself, it would be interesting to talk more with this man, to hear more about the claims, the research, and, of course, the evidence that you found when it comes to the survival of Adolf Hitler in Argentina, more beyond the, the what, five minutes or whatever you were given on Sky Channel. So uh, to hear what you're going to say about this is going to be uh, very interesting. But why don't we begin a little bit at the beginning, if you will. Why this subject, uh, Rorod? You're, you're a journalist, writer, and a film uh, director, but how did you stumble into, into, into this subject, uh, Gerard? <laughs> It's a long story, Henrik, but I'll, I'll try and keep it short. Um, I was sitting in a car park in the, um, by the Arashid Hotel in Baghdad in the Green Zone in 2005, wearing a flat jacket and a helmet, and I thought, I'm getting far too old to do this sort of stuff anymore. Um, I was there um, covering the American occupation of Iraq, um, one of the many international stories I've covered over the years. Came back to London, talked to a very good cameraman friend of mine, and he was tired as well. He'd just come out of Afghanistan with, with dysentery. So we both decided that we'd get back into making long-form documentaries. Um, I'd never been to Latin America, um, either of us. We traveled extensively, but never been to Latin America. And, and we decided to start with A. Um, so we went to Argentina. Um, we were doing a number of documentaries there, one on the children of the disappeared, who were the babies taken by the military during the fascist regime in the 70s in Argentina, and their mothers were killed. The babies were then brought up by, um, by members of the military and the government and the police force. Um, another documentary about um, the veterans of the Falklands Malvinas War, the Argentine veterans who fought um, the British on the Falkland Islands back in 82. Mm -hmm. And then I came across this story that Adolf Hitler had escaped to Argentina in a submarine. And I thought I'd do, for the first time in my life, a silly conspiracy theory documentary. Um, and that's how it started. When we started to look into it, it became pretty obvious that there was nothing silly or conspiracy theory about this. This was a story that had been hidden for 65 years and needed time. Hmm. Very interesting indeed. I mean, that's uh, there's a lot of interesting things when it comes to to South America and, and documents and details have been uh, coming out all the time when it comes to some of the anomalies around this, of course. But if we just would kind of, I guess, boil it down to some of the, the, the primary evidence that you found, uh, uh, go ahead and mention that and what that would be if you would to present your case, I guess, because this is a subject where a sure. lot of people get emotionally involved, some get angry, some get, uh, you know, disappointed, what have you. But just yes, uh, no, no, let, let's go ahead and see where we end up, okay? Well, we started at the very beginning, um, the end of April in 1945, in the bunker in Berlin, and looked at it thoroughly. There was no forensic evidence whatsoever. That was proved by an American scientist two or three years ago who tested the, um, the skull fragment that the Russians had claimed since the end of the war was that of Hitler. The skull fragment turns out to be that of a woman. Um, there are no witnesses to the actual moment of death of Hitler and Ada Brown. Um, there are no witnesses to hearing the shot or the shots that were fired to kill them. All there are are people in the bunker who saw two bodies draped in blankets taken up to the external part of the, of the bunker into the garden um, and supposedly covered in petrol and incinerated. But there are no 
there are no eyewitnesses to it being Hitler and David Brown there. What we found was at the time, nobody believed that Hitler was dead. Stalin told the Americans that he thought he'd escaped to Spain or Argentina. Marshal Zhukov, who was the commanding officer in charge of Soviet forces that took Berlin, when they took the bunker, he said that he'd probably fled, that he could have fled by airplane, that there was an airfield at his disposal. Um, the BBC's Thomas Cadet, who was one of the first Western reporters to arrive with the Soviet troops at the bunker, and I think we had a clip from Mr. Cadet, um, I think his, his piece stands on its own, and it explains exactly what was found in 1945. You know what, Let, let's play that, let's listen to that right away, right now. Outside the front door of the shelter are the five perforated petrol tins that were believed to have been used for scattering petrol on the body of Hitler and of burning it. But there, at any rate, my Soviet friends found no trace of Hitler himself. But there was the body of Goebbels, a shot outside the entrance to the shelter. I mean, to that is pretty clear that they found no body that could have been Hitler's. Um, we then went back and looked at all the contemporaneous reporting um, that was done by the Associated Press and Reuters um, and UPI, all the major agencies at the time. And there were lots of rumors and reports of rumors that he had escaped and flown to Spain and then on to Argentina. But one of the most intriguing reports we found was that from a Polish court in Warsaw in 1947, where a pilot um, who was accused at the time of being a member of the SS um, said that he had flown Adolf Hitler over Brown, General Hermann Fagelein, um, who was over Brown's brother-in-law and was supposedly executed. Um, in the bunker complex on Hitler's orders, but again, no body was ever found, um, had flown them out from the hocken Zollendam in Berlin, which is a very wide, long road, um, which at the time was in the hands still of good defending German forces, had flown on a strange dog leg down towards um, partly occupied Germany in Magdeburg, um, although didn't land at an airfield in Magdeburg, landed in a field, they used a Ju-52, which was the, the famous three-engined um, Junkers um, plane that was used as a transport plane by the German forces throughout the war. Um, it's known as the um, Anti-U or the, um, um, the Iron Annie. They landed briefly at Magdeburg and then flew on to Tonda in Denmark, um, which was the site in the first war of the Imperial Theatrum bases. At Tonda, they, um, the pilot, Captain Peter Bandart, uh, his plane, Hitler and his party got off it, and they got on another plane and were flown to, we believe, Travelmunder um, on the coast, where they then boarded a much longer range plane, a Ju-252, which had the range to fly from Denmark to Spain. Um, the aircraft that actually took Hitler from the field of Tonda in Denmark to Travelmunder came back and dropped a message container saying that they had made it, that they were free. Um, we had a witness on the ground as well, uh, an SS officer who had been wounded and flown medevaced out to the Tondra Air Base, who saw all this happen, saw Hitler arrive, um, saw them change planes, and then Hitler again leave, um, leave Denmark for, for the German base of travel number. So but there was incredible thorough reporting at the time. We haven't made any of this up. Um, this is from serious correspondence reporting at this trial in Warsaw of this German pilot. When the Polish judges first heard um, Captain Baumgart's statement, and Baumgart's an interesting character anyway, he was born in South Africa, uh, was a British citizen, and then came to Germany in the 1930s, um, he was obviously from German descent, and wanted to be part of the new Germany, joined the Nazi party, we believe, in 1936. Baumgart was said by the Polish judge, he said, you're crazy, you're completely mad, and he sent him away for psychiatric testing. Baumgart came back six months later. He had a completely clean psychiatric record um, from top post psychoanalysts, and he repeated the story that he told six months earlier in court um, <laughs> and added more detail to what he'd done. So we have a very clear picture of exactly what happened on April the 30th, 1945. So what happened after, I mean, obviously, first of all, um, 
no difficulty at the time when when the planes are landing the first in in Denmark then then in Spain uh, could planes just come and go like this this is still within the realm of war of course so I don't know how much control it was at the time on on planes and air traffic control and things like this well I, I think at this time at the end of the war and we're talking April 30th um, May the 1st 1955 you know, it really leaked like a sieve. I mean, there are numerous um, reports of German planes making it um, all the way to Spain. I think the most famous would be the Belgian fascist leader, Leon de Grel, who was um, an SS general and led the Flemish um, SS regiments on the Eastern Front. De Grel flew out of Norway um, in a, in a um, Heinkel 111, the, the classic sort of German bomber. And de Grel, de Grel made it all the way down to San Sebastian on the Spanish coast in an aircraft that had a much shorter range than um, the Nadal Hippos, uh, JU-252. There are also numerous other occurrences where large aircraft had made it out of Germany in the closing days of April 1945, um, all of which are detailed in the book, many of them um, which were seen by Western reporters, Allied reporters, on the ground in what was then, of course, neutral Spain, um, although not terribly neutral as far as we're concerned. Well, the interesting thing I think, sorry, Henry, the interesting thing I think is, is that when you look back at the reporting at the time, the Soviets, when they took the bunker and the chancery complex, they found a tunnel in, um, or an entrance to a tunnel in the personal quarters of Hitler in the Reich Chancery, not in the bunker, but in the Reich Chancery. That tunnel led down to a bunker deep underground, which was equipped for um, 12 people for a number of weeks. And so the Soviet Army um, reported in Time magazine and uh, completely you know, at the time taken as, as the correct facts. That bunker then had another tunnel which led into the, um, the underground system in Berlin, the U-Bahn system. And it's, it's down this tunnel that it looks like this escape party made it and then walked about, I don't know, four or five kilometers underground um, to the station at Hocken Zollendam, the Platz, which enabled them to come up and meet this JU-52, which was able to land and take off and take them out to Denmark. So. The material, the detail from both the Soviet forces and the later reports from the, um, from the trial um, are, are pretty thorough. And this seems to be been ignored. Um, I found it difficult to know why it was ignored. Right. That was one, one of my questions here. If this was the common reporting at the time, how and when did the story change all of a sudden? Well, I mean, the story didn't change for some people. Eisenhower in 1952 said that they had no evidence that Hitler was dead. They hoped he was, but they had no evidence that he was dead. Mm -hmm. And numerous stories about his survival continued on. The British put in a man called Hugh Trevor Roper. Oh, in yes. 19, yeah, and the man who wrote the last days of Hitler. Trevor Roper was appointed by the head of the intelligence services in Britain to go in and tell the story of the last days of Hitler. Um, Trevor Roper was an interesting choice. He'd worked behind a desk during much of, much of World War II, um, looking at German um, signal intelligence. Um, and before that, he was trained as a medieval historian. Now, why British intelligence chose him to do this job instead of somebody from Scotland Yard or one of our, uh, one of our great detectives from the time um, is a little beyond me. Trevor Roper went into Berlin. He interviewed um, a couple of people. Uh, one was the Luftwaffe adjutant um, in the bunker, um, who later said that he always laughed when he saw what Trevor Roker said he'd said because he knew he'd lied to him and he always found it amusing. Um, Trevor Roker also said that he'd interviewed Hannah Reich, Hitler's, um, the most famous female pilot of World War II, I suppose. She um, worked on the V-1 rockets. <laughs> she even flew V-1 rockets to work out how, how stable they could be. She flew a helicopter um, around the Olympic Stadium in Munich in the 30s um, and was a very, very decorated civilian pilot. She was also among the last people to see Hitler in the bunker in Berlin. But Hannah Reich later said that she had never been interviewed by Trevor Roper. He had simply taken parts of her interrogation that she had given to the Americans and then made the rest of it up. I find this I find this very strange. The, the book, The Last Days of Hitler, which I obviously have read on numerous occasions, is a polemic against Nazism, and you know it's the right thing to do. Nazism was a, the most terrible thing of the 20th century. I mean, these were a gang of murdering criminals. It was the heart of the political system behind it. They were just racist, murdering criminals. But Trevor Roper decided that he would come up with the story where. 
they had killed themselves in the bunker and that there were witnesses to it, which they weren't, um, and that that would be the definitive British view on the end of the war. And I think that what was needed to be done at that stage was that Britain needed the war to be over, and it became the accepted story. Uh, the Nazis got one thing very right. If you tell a lie loudly enough and long enough, it becomes the truth. And the historians afterwards have accepted Hugh Trevor Oper's view of this and have not looked back at the contemporaneous reporting, um, which is what, as a journalist, I was led to immediately. Well, I find this uh, behavior very, very strange, then, in that sense. If, if the, um, the head of the um, British uh, counterintelligence at the time, I think it was Dick White, uh, read yes, a little bit about quite. Trevor Roper, and, and, and he appointed him to, to, do, to get this task. Now, there's two possible explanations for that, then. One... This is an, a cover-up attempt, either consciously or they have an idea that they just don't want to, what, find out more because they're just tired, as you said, they want to have end the war and don't want to have anything more to do with this. I guess that's only two possibilities, possibilities I can think of. What do you think, uh, Gerard? I, I think that they basically wanted to draw, um, draw a veil over it. It was over. Britain was completely exhausted by World War II. And it was, they needed to say that Hitler was dead. So that they produced this report. Um, Trevor Oker even wrote the report under, under an assumed name, and does a major in country intelligence. Um, and that report was then said to be the truth. Um, the reality is, it's not the truth. Um, it's simply a report written by somebody under instructions to put um, a full stop at the end of a long and very unpleasant sentence, which was World War II. I mean, interestingly, we believe, and our research, Simon Dunson, my co-author, who's a military historian now, in mm -hmm. our research, mm -hmm. we believe that there was some sort of deal done between members of American intelligence and members of American big business, which had funded the Nazis um, for a very long time, um, to enable Martin Borman, who's sort of key man in all this, to escape with probably close to what we think of now as $180 billion of stolen money, um, and to take with him his hero, um, and also Gestapo Muller, the head of the SD at the time, who also escaped. I think that deal was probably done with Alan Dulles and his brother, um, Alan Welsh Dulles and his brother John Foster Dulles, and numerous, a small but very important group of what Kennedy later went on to describe as the military-industrial complex in America. And they did this because, in return, they were shown exactly where all the um, Germans' wonder weaponry was, or their research for their wonder weaponry was. They were told where the Merkers mine treasure was, which had the loot of occupied Europe, some of the most wonderful artworks that were ever taken. And they were given in pieces, including the whole of Werner von Braun's team, aspects of what the Germans had created during World War II, and in return to this, they turned a blind eye to them escaping to South America. Well, this is, I mean, more or less established, I think, at this point with Operation Paperclip, and we have a number of things happening right after the World War that is highly interesting when it comes to uh, not only Operation Paperclip, but also the rat lines. And, and, and this takes us to where we kind of left off in Spain, basically, but because the early stages of the rat line were actually drawn out from Spain. They were They were going from Spain first, and it wasn't until... Uh, later that they, the, it, it turned over to the what is known as the Roman rat lines, where, where basically the, the Catholic Church kind of took over, if you will. But in, in Spain, if we, if we take up the story there again then, uh, Gerard, what, what happened from there? Well, we believe that Hitler's aircraft landed at Royce, which is um, a military airfield about 80 miles southwest, 80 kilometers, 80 miles southwest of Barcelona, um, where we have reports from the time which say that a, a huge three-engined aircraft arrived, and was dismantled immediately. The party then got on board um, another aircraft belonging to the Spanish Air Force, and they were flown down to the Canary Island of Fuerteventura. Um, Fuerteventura, especially the, the, the bottom half of the island, um, is fascinating. Um, there's a place there called Villa Winter, which had been set up by the Adfair German intelligence in the late 1930s, um, partially sponsored by a fishing trip um, funded by Goering. And at Villa Winter, it was completely controlled by Germans. Slave labor was used to build the roads there. Slave labor from the um, socialists who fought Franco's um, fascists during the Spanish Civil War. 
There is also, and interesting enough, you can see this from the Google Earth maps, you will see the runway that was laid out in the 1940s at the bottom of the island of Puerto Ventura, which was big enough to take a very big aircraft. In fact, they didn't need one because they were using um, a relatively small plane to get them from Barcelona down to Puerto Ventura. And it's from Puerto Ventura that they were picked up by three um, U-boats, the last three of the U-boats from the last U-boat pack, um, interesting enough, called Seawolf, um, which was active in the North Atlantic in the closing days of World War II. Um, and boarding one of those U-boats, in fact, all three made it to Argentina, but boarding one of those U-boats, Hitler and David Brown, um, German, um, I'm sorry, German General Henry Fagelheim, um, all made it to the coast of Argentina after a 53-day voyage submerged. Hmm. Um, they got out on the coast at Nicotia, just um, just south of Mado Plata on the Argentine coast. Well, there you go. Very interesting. Were, were things already set up in uh, Argentine at this stage, or w w did they come there from, you know, with, with, with basically what they had with them, or, or no, what, what yes, happened there? The setup in Argentina was was um, huge. <laughs> they had a major German population. In fact, Argentina is the only place outside of Europe, well, the, to my knowledge, the only place outside of Austria and Germany where there was actually a Nazi party. Um, there were 60,000 members of the Nazi party. We have amazing footage of one of their rallies in Buenos Aires in 1937, which looks like something out of Nuremberg. There were uh, over a million and a half people of German descent there. Um, Martin Bormann had seen Argentina as an opportunity um, very early on, and he and the Abwehr had funded um, the generals and the colonels of the GRU who took power in 1941, 1943, I'm sorry. But Colonel Juan Perón, who later became President Juan Domingo Perón, and his wife Eva, the blessed Evita of popular culture, mm. were both paid Abwehr intelligence agents in 1941. We have the documentation, which was captured at the end of World War II, which shows that both Peron and his wife were in the pay of the Germans. So they were um, coming to a very welcoming situation. There was um, a huge amount of German investment in the country. Siemens were one of the major companies there, uh, which um, went on to handle a lot of the looted wealth out of Europe on behalf of the Bormann organization. So they were going to a land which was very, very, very European, um, many Italian and Spanish immigrants, but a great German population there as well. And they were going to going to friends. Um, Argentina had never declared war on uh, the Axis powers, Germany, and Japan, until right at the end of World War II. And they were, um, yeah, they were welcomed. There were many people there who would have welcomed them in many areas which were completely German. Well, exactly. We've had a lot of... Um dictatorships, fascist dictatorships popping up in South America uh, after World War II around that time, of course, and then and then one can question and, and wonder how much um, the, the originators, uh, you know, over from Germany in the beginning were behind some of these as well. We had the Chile, of course. Uh, there, there's many more examples. And I wonder what your take is on many of the strange stories, Gerard, that we've heard coming out from South America. Uh, consequently, in the years after the war, we have these um, you know, the movie popularized, of course, The Boys from Brazil, but this seems to kind of echo in one of the news articles came out, I think, a couple of years ago, about the, allegedly these uh, the twins from one of the cities there yeah, in Brazil, I, 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 I think. I think that, that story has um, since been proven to be um, you know, that bit of tabloid journalism that was, was taken too far. Okay, yeah. But, I mean, there, there are many, um, you know, real cases. I mean, Mengele did go to Argentina. He... Um, he took his driving test twice in San Carlos de Bariloche and failed. He um, he practiced in um, the Hotel Chaojao, which is about 15 kilometers south of San Carlos on the lake of Nauruhaki there. Um, Eichmann obviously got to Argentina. He was a regular in San Carlos de Bariloche. He holidayed down there. Um, there were Gauleiters who had escaped, who went on to run construction businesses around Bariloche. Friedrich Lanschner is, um, is possibly the most famous one there. But... Uh, we're now realizing that between the end of the war in 1945 and up until about 1950, up to 80,000 Germans made it to Argentina. Not all of them clandestinely and not all of them Nazis. Some of them just escaping to go to um, you know, a place in the sun, escaping from a ravaged, destroyed Europe, looking for, looking for a new life. But a great many of them were Nazis. And as you said, Henrik, they were helped, um, sadly, by the Catholic Church. 
um, which was heavily involved in the rack lines to get people into Argentina, um, Paraguay, Brazil. Um, and these people, for me anyway, haven't spent, you know, I've, I've been to Argentina 14, 15 times. And having done my stories on the, um, the fascist dictatorships in Argentina in the 1970s, it seemed to me that there was a, a huge injection of this European-based political poison of fascism into every country in Latin America post-World War II. Um, and, of course, much of this was supported by the American government because it was easier to have a controlled fascist right-wing um, southern continent on their borders than it was to have a socialist um, or communist-influenced one. Um, it became a pawn in the um, it became a pawn in the Cold War. Well, that's right. We, we've had a, a swing, if you will, then back and forth between these political extremes. I personally don't think that socialism is is really any better than fascism. Is another version of it, in in my view. But in any regard, we've I had agree with you. what what happened there. Why do we have now actually, in some cases, a majority of all socialist regimes in in South America? How, how long did this? Uh, go for and, and what happened that ended this uh, this uh, right wing uh, uh, fascist regimes over there? Then, well, I think to a certain extent, um, the lack of American support for them um, after the the end of the, the Cold War um, can't have helped the situation for the right wing, for the, the colonels and the generals, all those banana republics, banana republics as they're often described. Um, and I think that. You know, if you've lived under a fascist dictatorship, or effectively a fascist dictatorship, um, for 30 odd years, as people had in Chile, um, you look for something on the other side. Um, I think it's quite understandable that there is a, a rise of left-wing um, left governments in, in Latin America. Um, I mean, socialism can be seen as a dirty word, but I mean, it depends on how it's implemented. They don't seem to be following the Stalinist or, um, or Chen and Mao's view of communism or socialism. So I think it's also a very young continent, Henrik. It's not like not like Europe, um, and these are these are young democracies um, post fascism, and I think they're trying to find their way. Um, sometimes they get lost. Do you think that the uh, involvement of the of the Europeans are, are completely out of, of of meddling in their business and and uh, you know resources and all what have you you know from the European point of view in South America right now, or are they still under? Uh, that subtle control in one way or another behind the scenes. No, they're, they're completely under aspects of that control. I mean, for instance, Benison um, owns huge slaves in Patagonia. Um, there are still, I believe, large amounts of the looted fortune that the Bormann organization took with them post World War II to control certain aspects of Argentine, Brazilian, and Chilean um, industry um, and agriculture. Um, so there's still a major influence there, and of course, Europe and North America being the old um, industrialized nations, um, do you have a major thing what goes on down there, especially in oil exploration and everything else? You can see that by Britain so wanting to keep the Falkland Islands, just in case there are uh, huge deposits of oil there, which um, probably don't belong to the British, but then again. Yeah, in your book, Grey Wolf, The Escape of Adolf Hitler, that we're talking about, you have a pretty detailed view, obviously, of, of, of what happened and, and pretty much pin down the story as far as you see, see it, as far as, far as the, the research and evidence that you have found. Um, you mentioned that Otto Hitler finally died on, on uh, February 13th, 1962. Where, where does this uh, research come from? That material comes from um, documents which were provided to an Argentine researcher, Captain Manuel Monasterio. Captain Monasterio was also a... Um, a senator in Argentina, quite a senior politician, and um, up until a few years ago, we were in his 80s, he we was still very active um, looking after pensioners' rights in, um, in Buenos Aires. Captain Monasterio met, um, just happened to meet, an old German um, on the coast of Argentina back in the 1970s, and um, this German um, helped Captain Monasterio repair his car. And they got talking because the captain was a um, was a, um, a naval man, not a not a um, an armed forces man, but a merchant naval captain. And they got talking sailor to sailor. This this man had been on the Graf Spee, the German battleship that was um, destroyed by its captain in the River Plate in 1940. And after gaining each other's confidence, he told him that he had lived as Adolf Hitler's. I suppose we'd call it a Batman, but personal servant and um, confidant mm -hmm. in um, a little house just outside San Carlos de Bailoche in the Andes, 
since 1947, along with Hitler's personal physician, Dr. Otto Lehmann. And the, the Batman, who we believe is a man called Heinrich Becker, um, although he changed his name numerous times, um, gave Captain Monasterio Dr. Lehmann's papers. And the papers detail the period between 1947 and 1962, uh, Hitler's life in the Andes um, and his eventual death, as you say, on February 13th at 3 o'clock in the afternoon. Um, we have not seen those papers. The captain somehow managed to lose them. But he wrote a book um, in 1987 called Hitler Died in Argentina, Hitler Murió on, on Argentina. And it's a, it's a very strange book. The first third of it, he admits, he made up um, because he wanted to tell the story of the escape by submarine and the involvement of the Argentine military in the arrival of the submarines post-war, but was warned off by members of the government um, and was actually told that if you write this, you'll disappear. The second part deals with Heinrich Becker, who he calls Pablo Glocknick, his life um, with Hitler in the Andes. And the third part is a very detailed, very strange um, description of, from Dr. Otto Lehmann of Hitler and his involvement in mysticism and his involvement in political life. And Lehmann, it seems, had also been an early Nazi party member in Munich. Um, and had known many of the people who had gone on to become hierarchy within within the Nazi party. Now, this could have been dismissed if it had been written in 1997 or 2007, because a lot of that information that Lane details in his aspect of the book has since come out. But to have written it in 1987, you would need to have had access to thousands of books. You needed to have had access to incredible detail from the early parts of the Nazi party and also of Hitler's medical records um, to make it to make it real. And so we're pretty convinced that the Lehman papers might no reason to believe Dr. Um, Captain Monasterio would lie to us um, because I've interviewed him on numerous occasions and, and met him you know, lots of times after Simon. So we're pretty sure that Dr. Lehman's um, testimony is accurate and real. Very interesting indeed. Uh, we have a lot of things happening as, as you know, consequence that I want to try to get into a little bit later here. But the, just first of all, the, one of the photos you provided, Hitler's residence in, in Patagonia there from 1946 to 54. Have, have you been there? What's the, what, what yes, I have. Yeah. I mean, I've walked around. Um, one of the things I'd like to have done um, you know, when researching any story is it's very difficult to do that from, uh, from a distance. So I've walked around in Patagonia a lot and have been to the house at Inalco um, on two occasions. Um, it's a very strange place. At the time when it was built in 1940, it was started to be built in 1943, and Hitler moved in, we believe, um, late 1946, early 1947. It's part of an area that was known as Adolf Hitler's Valley, um, and was, was pretty much full of German um, escapees after, after World War II, um, which we detail in the book. Strange house. Um, a very, very beautiful location. At the time, you could only reach it by boat or by seaplane. Um, and it also seems to have, although I haven't been into them uh, because I was told they were dangerous, some sort of underground complex next to it. There are um, various uh, bits of metal sticking out, which were obviously ventilation shafts and things um, that were done there. And the caretaker told me that there were rooms underground in a large mound right next to, right next to the um, house of Tanaka. And we have you know, numerous, numerous witnesses who said that um, they lived there after the war. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I've been there. <laughs> so, um, why do you think that it is that very other few people... I've, we've done a program uh, with a few other guests about something called Operation Winnie the Pooh, which is another alleged oh, yeah. escape. Mm. Uh, don't know if you've heard about that. We, if yes, so, I you have. can comment on that if you want to, yeah? Not really. I'm not. I'm not a great believer in um, James Bond, Greg Hallett, and um, British commanders going into pick people out of Berlin. Yeah. Um, uh, to me, it, it, it's just fantasy. I can't see any detail for it at all, or any sourcing for it at all. Good story, but um, I'm sure it would have made a good film. But um, I'm afraid it's not something that our research has led us to believe has any veracity whatsoever. All right. Yeah. And uh, and and furthermore, then that there seems to be very. Other very few, in some cases at least, uh, to to follow through 
on this research? I mean, Jared, we have people who are, at least on the surface, uh, vehemently spending all their time hunting Nazis and things. They don't follow up on this kind of stuff, do they? Um, I, I, I think part of the reason, Henrik, is that Argentina is now a democracy um, and has been since, what, 80, 82 onwards, although it had a, a transition period which was pretty dubious. Um, and people are now willing to say things that they weren't willing to say when the military were in charge. So there's that aspect of it. We're now also, you know, files are being opened, um, or not as many as I would like, and there are so many files in the British archives and the American archives, which have stamped secret for another 50 years on this particular topic. Um, files are being opened, and people are giving deathbed confessions. I mean, we interviewed a man back in December in London, who's an Argentinian, um, coming up to 80 now, who, as a very young waiter in the Naval Hotel in Buenos Aires, had waited on Hitler and Martin Bormann on two separate occasions in mm -hmm. 1953 and 1956. Now, he's never told anybody about this. He surfaced after he read an article in one of the national newspapers here. Um, the journalist on the national newspaper, who I um, had come to know, contacted me and said, Gerard, this guy sounds like a, a pretty good witness. Um, and I went and interviewed him um, on tape. Um, it's a video tape interview which will be broadcast later this year. And he was extremely thorough in the details that he'd given them. And I asked him at one stage, and um, I can't give you his name at the moment. Ah, so he doesn't um, want to have the video published as well then? No, the video, the video will be published later this year, but he's asked me not to, uh, not to give his name out until it's done. Okay. Um, but let's call him Roberto. Um, I said to him, well, that's a why now? Why now? And he said, yeah, I'm not going to live forever. Um, he said, I'm, I'm quite ill. I had problems with my kidneys, and um, I believe this story should be told. And he was one of you know, many witnesses I've met who hadn't asked for any money, um, hadn't asked for fame. And in fact, you know, two of our witnesses, including Captain Monasterio in, in Argentina, Argentina, had been threatened with death for talking to us, for working with us. And that was one of the sort of tipping points for me as a journalist. Um, you don't threaten people with death unless they've got something to tell you which other people don't want to hear. Um, well, that's was interesting as well because when he <coughs> he described Martin Bormann, um, who he had seen on these two occasions with Hitler, and I said, so what does Bormann look like um, when you saw him? And he looked at me and he said, he looked like, a lot like you, Gerard, only a little skinnier. Now, this would mean nothing apart from when I interviewed the bodyguard of Juan Domingo Perón, who's also in his 80s in Argentina, who had also seen Bormann meeting with President Perón at the time in 1953, I said to him, so what did Bormann look like? And he looked at me and he said, a lot like you. So these are two separate witnesses, one in London and one in Buenos Aires, who had both seen Martin Bormann at this time, who were both able to describe him in a way that I found quite chilling. Um, as you can imagine, Henrik, it's not nice to be um, <laughs> described as looking like one of the one of the Nuremberg war criminals who was found guilty of mass murder in that case. This is uh, interesting. There is a few other cases. I just want to highlight this as well. We had another guest a while back, Peter Lavenda. He allegedly as well went to uh, Villa Bavaria or, or uh, you know Colonial Dignidad, as it's known as as well. Uh, this yeah, is one Colonial of those. Dignidad, yeah. yeah, this is one of those places where where you still apparently then I don't know how it is today, but but at the time he was there and so forth, there there's still some some stuff there. But if you say that things are really set up in Argentina, I mean, even even U boats, what, what happened to all this stuff? Where is it today? Can we go find it? Is it still there? Is it hiding away? Well, there, there are some aspects of it. I mean, there's one amazing place called the um, Hotel Vienna, which is on the inland sea in Argentina, up in Cordoba province of Machu Quita which was built in 1941 by the Nazis. Um, it was built by a director of Siemens, who was also at their military intelligence in Argentina. Um, and we have the records of that from both America and from Germany at the end of the war when they were captured. And this place is a hotel complex, which in 1943, 44, when it was finished, would have been, um, I don't know, one of the best hotels in the world. Attached to it is a hospital wing. Um, where we believe that numerous Nazis had plastic surgery immediately after the war um, or were treated for wounds that they'd received either escaping or, or during the war. Um, it was closed in 1947. Um, it never opened to the public. The staff there were all German um, from Buenos Aires and um, they were armed and there were lookout towers on the sea and everything else. I mean, it's, it's a very strange place. 
Um, there are well, you only have to go down to San Carlos de Bariloche or up to Villa Belgrano in Argentina, and you will see that the whole area looks like Bavaria. Um, you know, all the housing is, is of German stock. Mm -hmm. um, they have natural breweries now, which are very nice, and produce good beer. Um, but the whole place is very German. I mean, people have a strange, even I had a very strange view of Latin America. You know, people with sombreros and llamas and everything else. But if you go to Argentina, it's the whitest country in the world. Um, and when you go down to places like San Carlos de Bariloche and the area around there, German is still spoken um, quite extensively. There are German schools down there. Um, and you'll see all the estate agents have adverts in German uh, for the housing down there and, and everything else. So although the, there were structures built to it, take the Nazis and take the escapers, what really happened was it was just part of Argentine national society, part of the national infrastructure. Yeah, Argentina is an interesting uh, place, as you mentioned before, that a million and a half Germans. Uh, uh, there's actually, by the way, the Jewish community is, is big there as well, and this is kind of an yes, interesting tidbit. Yeah, uh, you know, good. kind of confusing. Uh, <laughs> what what happened there? Well, no, there we, been were, we were quite closely with the um, with the umbrella organization for the Jewish community in Argentina, Daya, um, who didn't have um, much information on Hitler, but they had a great deal of information on Martin Bormann and. Um, we work quite closely with them. There's a big, um, there's a big Jewish community. I think it's almost 400,000 people in Argentina, and mm -hmm. it's been there quite a long time as well. And I think the interesting thing about Peron's type of fascism, and you know, people will still debate, especially in Argentina, whether Peron was a fascist. But from my point of view, the guy looks like a fascist. Um, his type of fascism wasn't at all anti-Semitic, and he had Jews in his cabinet. Um, and saw them as a you know vibrant passing community. It also seems to me that post-war, the Nazis in um, in South America, the people who had escaped and the people who ran the Bormann organization post-war, I think they sort of realized that the, that the Nazi brand was completely and totally spoiled, ruined. <laughs> Thank mm. God. Um, you know, you couldn't march behind a swastika anymore, and you couldn't go around killing Jews or homosexuals, or, or communists, or anything else. Um, and that they turned the whole system, and the, the finances they had to run that system, into business. And they were just there to make the money, just to make money, to profit from things. Um, and they would profit from that with a, with a fascist approach to life, but that didn't necessarily include being, um, being mass murderers, because that didn't work. There's they lost. Uh there's much more, obviously, we want to talk with you about and, and things we want to go into. I've heard uh, uh, speculations as well, obviously, that, as, as you mentioned here, that Bormann uh, survived, and he seemed to be kind of one of those who actually hanged on for, for a long time. You have a story as well in the book where, basically, Bormann turned his back on Hitler, right? Tell us about that. I think so. I, mean, I think what Bormann did, he was, always the, um, he was always the main access point to Hitler from 1943 on. And I think that what he did was to limit access to Hitler when he when he escaped. I think mean, Hitler was also tired, probably not very well. Um, although he was only 56 when he got into Argentina, so he wasn't an old man. Um, but I think Bormann realized that to be successful in the new in the new world post-war, that the Nazi Party was over. Um, that any idea of you know one Führer leading it and especially Adolf Hitler. Uh, being associated with the death of well, uh, six million people um, industrially in Europe and God knows how many millions of people elsewhere um, during the war was something that they could not rise behind again. This was something, he was a, he was a leader who was, whose time was done and it was best that he was discarded and thrown away into the dustbin of history. And I think that's pretty much what Bormann did. He stopped people getting to see him. Um, he made sure that he couldn't become a rallying point. And yet there seems to have been some sort of basic loyalty to this man um, from Gorman, which meant that he couldn't you know, kill him um, and that he would just let him die quietly and naturally. Um, well, I mean, died tormented, demented, and betrayed, as far as I'm concerned, in Argentina. Um, and Gorman was, was the architect of that, that, that end. Um, that was his final solution. Um, to what had become the problem of Hitler post war. Hmm. And do you think that he, um, some of his, I mean, what, what, do, what do we know during his decisions during this time, what he actually 
did in Argentina? Is this continuing of the strategy? Did he just want to spend his, his life, uh, you know, hiding out and not doing anything anymore? Do we know anything? I don't, I don't, in Martin Bormann's case, there was no question of hiding out. I mean, he was um, the man who controlled one of the largest single amounts of money in history um, available to one man. And I believe, and I mean, my research and finance research shows that a great deal of that money went back into Germany post-war. Um, was partially responsible, at least, for the West German economic miracle. Um, and it's also partially responsible for making Germany the uh, economic powerhouse that it is in Europe today. How, how did it? How did the money go back to, to uh, Germany? Investments in companies, or, or how did yes. that happen? Okay. Uh, very much so, investments in companies. I mean, there were various deals and dodges that they did where they would bring material in from Mercedes-Benz into Argentina and pay twice what it was worth. And the money would go from Argentina back into Mercedes-Benz in Germany. Um, the same was true for Siemens products and for, um, for you know, the, the various breakups of the Argentine Farben group as well. Um, also, a lot of the the lot of the wealth that went out didn't go out in cash and diamonds and artworks and things like that. It went out in bearer bonds. It went out in shareholdings and companies. Bormann set up something like 700 front companies in um, neutral territories from 1943 on. And it was to them that money was funded. And using the International Bank of Settlements in Switzerland and um, various other Swiss banks who didn't seem to care where the money came from as long as they got their percentage, and that's pretty true of bankers around the world, um, that money was fed back into the system um, of you know, the new West German Republic. And um, it went to build and rebuild Germany into, as I said, the economic powerhouse that it is today. There is a, another, if you will, in conspiracy theory involving uh, the European Union, the creation of the European Union. And one of the supporting pieces of evidence, and I want to ask you about this, is the so-called Red House Report. And apparently this is an official U.S military intelligence report, and people can look this up or search for it. It was called EW-PA-128. And the, the only problem I have with this report is, is I've only been able to find one single source to this, which is a uh, Adam Libor who wrote this, and this was published later in the Daily Mail. This is also a couple of years ago now. Have you read that? What do you make of this report? Yeah, I've, I've, seen, um, I've seen the Red House report. I've, I've seen it from other sources as well. And um, if I can, I'll, I'll track those down and send them to you. Um, so you can, you can use them and have a look at them. Uh, the Red House report is important, but it is just one example of the flight of capital out of Germany um, when in, there was a, a turnaround from Bormann and Bormann's um, cabal within the Nazi leadership which said, okay, you have to prepare for defeat now. And I think it was mainly after the Battle of Kursk on the Eastern Front where the Germans got hammered um, and the coming Second Front in Europe, um, where they said, we now have to plan for defeat. And that means that we will be defeated militarily, but we cannot afford to be defeated politically and economically. So move your money out. And there were you know, huge shipments of gold, never mind what was shipped into, into the Swiss banks, um, Companies set up in Syria, um, in Turkey, in Argentina, in Brazil, um, and of course in Spain, um, where this capital was was pushed out. And you have to remember also that a lot of these companies owned shares in things like Standard Oil, they owned shares in Chase Manhattan, the Ford Motor Company. Um, so it was a very complex business structure even then, it's not as complex as our business structure or financial structure could become today but a complex structure that enabled somebody who understood it to move money, to move rural power. Um, and that's what Bowman and his his various acolytes did. I think the Red House meeting, which is in Strasbourg, if I remember correctly, set that out in a very particular way. They had senior industrialists there, and they were told, the war's over. We're not going to win. So we have to move into a position where we can have an influence post-war. And that's what was done. There, there is one um, another piece to this whole puzzle, and you you briefly men mentioned it before as well. And I want to touch a little bit, little bit upon, upon this because we have tracks and, and things like that leading to other industrialists. There is a, a build up of Germany at the time, which is uh, you know monumental, of course, before the Second World War. And people like Anthony C. Sutton, for instance, has written books like Wall Street and the Rise of Hitler that shows mm -hmm. that this is funded in some cases by Wall Street industrialists behind the scenes. What's your take on that, uh, George? Well, I mean, in, I think, 1933, Alan Welsh 
um, Dulles and John Foxy Dulles, who are corporate lawyers representing the most, um, you know, the largest corporations in America, went to Germany. They met with Hitler, Hess, and with Berman, who wasn't very important in those days, but um, with Hess, he's number two. And they funded the Nazi Party to the tune of one billion American dollars at that time. This was the equivalent to the gross domestic product of the United States in 1933. And um, we know that the Ford Motor Company invested hugely in Nazi Germany. In fact, Ford were responsible for about one-third of the um, trucks that took German soldiers to fight Allied soldiers on the beaches in Normandy. Um, Ford was an anti semite from the 1920s. Um, he was awarded Hitler's highest civilian decoration. And, um, you know, people still drive Ford cars today, which I find a bit disgusting. IBM, there's new evidence, I think, in the last couple of days has come out that Although they supplied the counting machines, the early computers, which enabled the Germans to run the Holocaust, they were much more closely involved in it than people have ever known before. And this material is only coming out 70 years later. Um, there's so many dirty stories about how big business and the Nazis worked together. Um, Wall Street were you know, very responsible for the rise of the Nazi party in Germany. Maybe they simply didn't realize, Henrik, how bad these people were going to be. Is, is that a is that what you think is going on here? Is that a sufficient well, I think excuse? Maybe in 1933, you know, it, we're not crystal knocked hasn't happened. The major pogroms haven't happened. Um, the race laws haven't been reenacted, haven't been enacted. Um, the new the race laws. Maybe they thought that hey, you know, Germany needs to rebuild. It's a huge power in the center of Europe, and we should be helping this. There's money to be made here. And then once they were involved, and they began to realize what disgusting creatures these Nazis were. Maybe it was too late, or maybe they were just making too much money and they didn't give a damn. Um, and that's probably where I think it went. They were making too much money and they didn't give a damn. Well, it, it, that's a good point as well in one sense, because the, we have an immediate, um, how should we put it, disqualification of certain people historically just because they're seen in a photo shaking hands with Adolf Hitler. And this, isn't the, this wasn't the... Uh, the case, of course, at the time, we have people like you know King George or or the leader of the uh, you know Islamic uh, you know country at yeah, the time, one of the Muftis, whatever. Yeah, exactly. I mean, but this, I mean, Hitler was a great political um, you know phenomena back in the 30s. He was, he was, he was a time, time magazine uh, man of the year. Right, exactly. You know, so <laughs> the, know, these I mean, people they, couldn't cu cut off the the political relationship with this man because it, 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 this hasn't unfolded yet. So people shouldn't disqualify someone else just because they're seen in a photo with Hitler. It doesn't prove anything, if I put it that way. No, I mean, you know, our best friend in the Middle East for many years was Saddam Hussein. Well, there you go, exactly. And this, that, that shows a little bit. He was the bulwark against um, Iranian, Iranian fanatic called um, Islam. Um, and so, you know, Britain supplied him with tanks, America supplied him with aircraft. Um, you know, he was, he was our big friend in the Middle East. And this shows um, a little bit of how, 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 the, how, how the things is run behind the scenes. It shows a little bit of how uh, it's kind of business as usual, and people are beneficial in different times uh, for different purposes. But war is business. But is that all that's going on here? Is this the only reason we have these industrials working with Germany, building them up? Uh, you know, we have, of course, the history of World War One. We can't exclude that and just look uh, only at World War Two because that that, uh, that leaves out uh, more than half the picture. But w what do you think we can attribute this to, uh, Gerard? Why is, do we see these connections and relationships? I, I think there's a, there's a group of people out there, and it, it, there's something the Illuminati, <laughs> Bilderberg, or anything like that, as far as I know. But I think there are a group of people out there who are very powerful and occasionally come into the orbit of other very powerful people. And they realize that they can make money out of these situations. And the profit motive drives them, drives them on all the time. Um, and I don't think this is a, a group that you know, works together closely all the time, but there are a group of people who obviously run the world, you know, senior businessmen and, and maybe some politicians and senior bankers um, in all different aspects of the world, and you know, that would be China, America, the United Kingdom, or flesh of it, um, who bump into each other as their um, interests overlap, and they look at each other and they go, well, we don't actually care about the little people. How do we make money out of this? Yeah.
Yeah. And, you know, that, that, that might be just me being a cynic after 30 odd years in journalism and, you know, having <laughs> yeah. I think years right. on I think you're right, though. five years on this story. Yeah. No, I, I think my you're dad, right. My yeah. dad, who was a combat soldier in World War II, my father fought all the way up through North Africa, you know, joined up at 18, fought through North Africa, up through Italy, was wounded in Italy, um, and was in Germany at the end of the war because he was a German speaker. If my father was still alive today, Henrik, and knew what had gone on in the background, I think he'd be picking up a rifle and going after someone um, because he'd be that disgusted at you know the the, the way in which people take advantage of all the hundreds of thousands of kids who die. Well, uh, you're right. I mean, people are are sacrificed on the geopolitical scene for for purposes at the time that seems uh, maybe you know noble or what have you. We're, we're meant to fight for nationalism, but then. Uh, what, 20, 30 years later, it's just sold out, and now we're going into an international mode and the European Union and everything else. You know, it's it's very strange to me, very strange to me. Yeah, and I mean, the problem with a story like Hitler escaping and or Hitler being allowed to escape, along with very senior other members of Nazis, and for that having been hidden for such a long time, um, it just makes you wonder how much else is hidden from us. Um, I mean, I know governments lie. There were no weapons of mass destruction in Iraq. I think that's the best example from recent history. Um, and Henry Kissinger is a, a great proponent. He once said that the illegal, what's it? He said the illegal we can do immediately. The unconstitutional takes a little longer. <laughs> yeah, that's a good one. Wow. And there's a lot of people, uh, well, a, a group of people out there who um, who think that's a perfectly reasonable thing to do. Yeah, you're right. You're right. Um, Okay, so why don't we begin to wrap things up here then for this time. We've covered a lot of ground here, Rod, and there's a lot more to the story, of course, and we're going to pick this up at a later uh, date and see if we can talk about some of the details about the book. But for now, uh, please go ahead and mention, of course, the title of the book again, where people can go to pick up a copy and read more about this story for themselves, uh, Gerard. Sure. The book is called Grey Wolf, The Escape of Adolf Hitler. The case presented. Um, it's available on Amazon um, all over the world. Uh, currently, it's only being published in English and hardback, but that's in Australia, America, Canada. Um, but it is also available on Amazon in Germany, Italy, and Spain, um, and on Amazon in Japan. Um, the paperback comes out in September, October, I think. And we're also producing a drama documentary um, at the moment on this, which I hope to have on air later this year. Um, on international television. And people can see more about that on the author's page uh, for me, that's Gerard Williams, at Amazon, um, either Amazon.com or Amazon.co.uk. Um, I think it, it's an interesting read and does expose what I feel is one of the, uh, one of the greatest hidden stories of um, the 20th century. Absolutely. Another uh, you know, factor or, or a fact tidbit of history that is covered up, and there's so much of this, of course, and this has been very interesting hearing about your work and about your research. So we say thank you very much for your time today, uh, Gerard. We really appreciate it. Thanks very much, Henry. Nice talking to you. Interesting material. There's a lot we don't know about World War II and World War I as well, and what led up to that first war. Much is excluded in the history books, and today we get a very kosher and one-sided view of history. There's a lot more to add to this picture to be able to understand it completely. Where the discussion and examination needs to go next concerning this topic, I believe, is towards looking at the crimes of the Bolsheviks and the Zionists on the other side of the camp. Red Ice Radio will continue to examine the claims and research from many different sides of the story so that you have the capability to decide for yourself what is the truth. For now, thank you for listening and we'll be back soon with more radio. For example, Paul Levy, Dean Clifford, Carl Munk, James Gilliland, Larry Scranton, David Icke, Robert Schock, Hockham Bloomfist, Desiree and J.J. Hurtak, and Mike Cross. We welcome your guest and topic suggestions as well. In the meantime, thank you for listening. We'll be back with more in just a few days. Take good care.